you saw before. Um, I'm Matt Suazo uh, from Google and work on supply chain security. And I'd like to talk a bit about a project that we've been, an idea that we've been working on uh, for, for a few years, working towards. And uh, if the image is confusing, as you saw on the slide, that was uh, generated with the prompt open source security. And it was too good not to include. Maybe he was right. It, uh, it captured something about it. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about just the integrity piece of, uh, of open source security in general, and the language package space specifically. Um, simply put, we don't have a great understanding of where and how um, language packages are produced still. Um, and I don't think this audience needs any convincing that packages are you know, ubiquitous, important, run in sensitive contexts, and importantly, often have sort of opaque, changeable ownership, development, distribution uh, structures. So it is uh, an important problem to get right. How exactly do we think about this? Or what, what is the problem uh, break down into? And um, I view it as, uh, first of all, sort of transparency, so just understanding uh, bits about the build. This can be you know, the build itself or um, the publisher, uh, all aspects of that sort of uh, place in the build, as well as the sort of security aspects of that build, so the integrity piece. And lastly, um, can I, as a consumer, uh, reproduce the build? Maybe I need to patch it. Maybe I have some um, additional compiler flag or tool chain I want. Is there a way for me to easily do so? Why do I care? Uh, in, in this uh, domain of supply chain attacks, we actually have some really good uh, examples to pull from. Uh, so first of all, SolarWinds, but, you know, their build system became compromised, and the outputs of their build were um, differing from what they would expect. And sort of the second layer of that uh, in the CodeCov attack, a build tool got compromised, and a lot of open source projects that were using it in their CI environment suddenly gave over um, a lot of authority to, um, yeah, that malicious code, which then got published. And I think we should all be, you know, um, aware enough that uh, attacks are happening uh, fast and loose, and it's really only a matter of time before, um, you know, before you or your loved ones get, uh, get compromised the same way. Um, so it would be great if things work this way. And, you know, it's not flawless, but it is a much more direct sort of trust relationship between the actual artifact you're consuming, the package, and the publisher, the intent of the software uh, maintainer, author. Um, you know, some ecosystems uh, attempt to and arguably do uh, sort of achieve this model. Go is uh, one of the main ones that have, you know, this has been an explicit goal. But even in cases where you are dealing with just source code uh, being distributed, builds are um, you know, often useful, uh, if not unavoidable. Um, even simple like pre-compilation steps can save downstream users meaningful time. So even you know, cutting 50 seconds off of a compile, that's huge for you know, uh, an artifact that may be consumed you know, hundreds, thousands of times. It really adds up. So even in the absence of necessity, it can be uh, useful. But obviously, we, uh, we introduce a bunch of uh, risks, mainly the center build ones uh, that we care the most about. And yeah, we can't, we can't avoid that uh, in the sort of common case. So how might we start to think about a solution to these, to these problems? Um, so I think cost is a big one to package maintainers, which arguably sort of reflect the value in you know, these uh, package ecosystems. We want something that is maybe flexible enough to apply to many all um, language ecosystems. And uh, something whose uh, sort of integrity properties can be readily accessible to consumers. So consumers see and can sort of um, verify the value that, you know, uh, system um, tries to provide. So one approach 
is to have uh, the builds themselves, or the build systems rather, generate provenance that we consider you know, trusted. Air quotes if you want. For some definition of trusted, we have a, uh, you know, an artifact describing the way um, a, a package was built. So I think these unquestionably are part of the solution. This is, um, even if they're best effort or whatever, people should be you know, showing their work, so to speak. Um, but I think for now and maybe into the further future, uh, they are kind of incomplete in important ways. And the published sort of provenance doesn't, um, doesn't offer us enough confidence to assert that a, um, you know, a consumed artifact is free from compromise. There are many ways to inject badness into a build. So I think another uh, important sort of uh, idea, and obviously is well represented in this audience, is you know, we create a new ecosystem. Stronger defaults, uh, more like built-in properties, um, mandated sort of um, integration support. OS packager, system packagers like Debian and Nix, um, you know, have great and very uh, related work to what I'll be talking about, um, but exist in those sort of subdomains. And tools like Conda exist, um, you know, to, to further that like, cohesion point. Um, the demand sort of that everything interoperates even in the presence of complexity. And I think these uh, satisfy many of the requirements However, they, they are ultimately sort of a different model. And in the, in the worst case, they can end up sort of forking uh, attention or you know, contributions away from, from upstream. Another s solution, and uh, is uh, the title of the talk, or part of it, is uh, sort of the idea of trusted rebuilds, so very similar to the trusted build concept I spoke about a moment ago. Um, which sort of is a provenance generating build, but in a separate trust domain. So in a sort of uh, using input from the source repo, the upstream artifact, using heuristics, can we generate a sort of build that matches upstream? And then can we distribute that provenance and that provenance alone, not the artifact or anything, that sort of attestation of rebuild from a given configuration. Um, yeah, can we distribute that to the consumers for a comparable or even uh, you know, improved um, integrity than the one a, uh, a developer may provide? What sorts of benefits might this provide? I think the first one, relating back to the third-party packagers case, is that we we would really like the focus right, to be on the, um, the source of sort of development and contribution from a, um, from a maintainer. And I think this, this gets at that, right? We can uh, speak specifically about builds um, the maintainer is distributing to maybe the largest or the most significant um, set of consumers, certainly with the widest audience. Um, now, this one, I think, maybe is best uh, described as just like it collectivizes the cost of um, paranoia. It, it gets us all that are maybe interested in these properties more focused on the solution and potentially uh, with the you know, exception of the maintainer that they can you know, not do anything and inherit these you know, uh, better um, integrity guarantees than they may you know, be capable, willing, able to provide in their own release processes. And another uh, benefit is that this is retroactive. So we don't need a re-release of software that may be, you know, old, abandoned, um, not, yeah, unmaintained. Um, and sort of that integrity piece can be important for you know, software, which can be used many years and decades into the future. All right, so now I'd like to uh, take a brief um, uh, stroll down the kind of uh, 
higher level, um, if you can believe it, uh, lane of rebuildability, um, you know, reproducibility or uh, rebuilding. And sort of what are the properties that we can maybe get out of here? So there's gonna be very few words at this late time in the day, mercifully. So we have our build and our rebuild, and we have some tools, maybe an environment that was used to produce it, and they both produce a package which for our purposes can be assumed to be equivalent. So there's an abstract model, and we can bend the diagram. We can uh, sort of represent it as sort of an incomplete overlap of the uh, tools, systems, that were used to actually produce this artifact. When they're trusted and benign, we're fine. They're going to produce the same thing, and we expect their results to match. However, when, you know, maybe the original build had a special gift that we uh, don't, you know, see in our rebuild. Um, if we're assuming the compromise is happening from the build itself, we can know that, uh, you know, from the lack of reproduction, that we did not have that same maybe backdoor, um, maybe compromise dependency like CodeCov, and will sort of necessarily fail to produce the same output. However, if that there is this fun overlap, uh, then we both get the gift, and we may sort of rebuild a version that is, um, you know, provably the same, but unwanted, right, still. Um, but I will say an important quality, or an important consequence, as I said before, is that if there is a backdoor dependency, um, at least one of them, I guess, needs to be in our rebuilds dependency set, right? Which means we ha have control of that build separate from the actual upstream build, and we can do work to become more and more confident that it is, uh, you know, it is free from, uh, you know, something that could backdoor it. Some of the strategies we can use to sort of build our confidence there is, um, you know, in the absence of provenance, you know, we just know, right, in our rebuild, or we can see, we can find out what we're actually using, right? So that, even just that tells us something. Uh, and even when we do have provenance, we do have a, uh, you know, a build, uh, it's almost certainly going to be incomplete for our purposes. You know, there may be um, default uh, uh, environmental factors that are just implicitly uh, present in the build and are not you know, immediately accessible, like the stuff pre-installed on like a GitHub Actions worker, say, runner. Another strategy is, is diversification, right? So if we, if we are concerned about that overlap, the center of that Venn diagram, one strategy is we can just, you know, fuzz or change up or, uh, you know, swap out our uh, build tools, our the sources of functionality that we get for others. Um, admittedly, the plunger to screwdriver is not, you know, I don't know what job that would satisfy both, but we, uh, you know, we can apply it as aggressively as we have time for, or as, as much confidence as we want to build, we can, um, we can use this. And the last and probably most uh, intuitive strategies, we can just make the build simpler, right? We can remove things from our trust base and thus shrink the things that could possibly be in that overlap set. Um, yeah, and in a lot of cases we can safely do so. Like CodeCov, we're just building the thing. We don't uh, need all of the additional stuff that might run and be useful in CI, linting, testing, um, but that may you know, leach into the, the trust base for the upstream build. So returning to our list of threats, we have at least talked about uh, mitigations and in some cases um, grown confident that we can solve a lot of the build-related ones. Um, and wh what that ends up getting is, is a model very close to our original ideal, is removing in as much sort of possibility as we can at least muster in this case, uh, uh, 
uh, coming as close to our to our ideal. All right, so now to uh, our idea for how you know we could actually apply these things and how um, you know we might bootstrap a lot of the uh, trust in the um, ecosystems, language ecosystems that we care about in a uh, sort of uh, the branding OSS rebuild. And uh, so, so what, is, what, is that, what does that mean? So I think uh, automation has proven uh, surprisingly effective and we have a lot of ideas for how it can improve to capture a, a large portion of the builds in open source, most of them fundamentally are like archiving operations. And a lot of the more complex ones are pretty well specified in, say, CI, um, because they need to be. Because for development, it is really tedious having different results than, uh, than your collaborators. So they are already pushed into the path of you know, systematizing their builds. So then it just becomes recovering them from what is often present in the repository. And also crowdsourcing, so enabling the manual specification of rebuilds, um, I think it's important to support, uh, to cover things that might you know, fall outside of automation. And eventually, maybe um, a lot of those can be sort of subsumed into the, the automation. Hosting those rebuilds, so doing those rebuilds in a uh, transparent and distributable uh, way, and then publishing that transparently. Uh, providing attestations and you know, showing our work, right? Um, providing the, the um, information necessary to rebuild the artifact. Yeah, it's not rocket science. It's, uh, it's just doing a build, right? Uh, it's uh, yeah, inferring maybe from automation at the top, uh, you know, volunteers, or at the bottom, other provenance. And, alluded to why that might be interesting, I'll cover it in a second, but uh, we can maybe recover a build definition that is sort of in the format that we need um, and can produce an artifact that we can then compare at a sort of semantic level, which a lot of times is enough. We can you know, talk through what semantic means, but uh, we can, regardless, um, publish that result if we you know, find a, uh, a comparison. Uh, as, as provenance, as rebuild provenance. So for the build definition, uh, our current sort of setup publishes this as a Docker file, which is, uh, you know, imperfect as all solutions are, but is, you know, for better or worse, uh, human readable, writable, um, very quick to build, and um, you know, a relatively mature format. And we don't need you know, custom YAML placed everywhere. That uh, you know, is a simple way to do so, but um, ultimately less descriptive right, than a Docker file, which can encompass like a full environment and build entry point. And to that you know, notion of sort of semantic comparison, um, right now it is mainly concerned with removing the uh, variability in um, compression, archiving formats, which are designed for other things. And you know, in spite of having a lot of capability to store information, our assertion is largely that that is um, either entirely uh, uninteresting from a security perspective, or at least um, notable. So we can, we can point out anything that is odd. So why might it be useful to rebuild prominence. As I said, we can get more information even if the user published you know, um, their build process. So this can be sandboxing their build, um, introspecting you know, the file system, syscalls, uh, network accesses. And we have built a fair bit that sort of automates a lot of steps in these processes. And there is a, uh, I feel, a good you know, a feasible path that um, eliminates users from this, uh, you know, requirement of porting pretty easily in the most common cases. So wh where's the focus now? Um, NPM, as I mentioned, is uh, newly supporting of a native uh, package provenance. And 
uh, Rust and Python fall into a similar buckets of mostly source distributed um, uh, artifacts. However, recently in the Rust community, there was a maintainer who, uh, not unreasonably, uh, was concerned about the cost of the, uh, his crate on the uh, compilation times downstream and chose to pre-compile and said, you figure it out. And maybe we can. <laughs> that doesn't feel that unreasonable to me, uh, that we can, uh, we can provide that service. And I think this fits in uh, well with other uh, you know, industry efforts at uh, solving various pieces of the uh, supply chain. Uh, Deps.dev, for those of you who are unfamiliar, indexes uh, metadata, provides a big query table for all of uh, NPM, PyPy, um, Cargo, many others. And we can actually validate what they ingest, which is uh, admittedly best effort, is what most current um, ecosystems are working with, and uh, an additional um, nicety is that we can use scorecards, which is an evaluation sort of a, of a project's um, you know, security properties at a given point, um, knowing that that you know, package could have been produced from that point. And lastly, I'll mention Salsa, which we are, uh, are using as the format for the uh, build evidence, and Guac, which can enable us to um, query that, uh, the supply chain that we are now sort of you know, much more recording in much more detail. All right, and you know, just to recap, I think I think rebuilding idea of trusted rebuild, and the sort of idea of a system like uh, OSS rebuild can provide uh, all three of these things in you know, um, in a sort of well-aligned incentives-wise uh, fashion, and that it's worth further exploration. Happy to hear everyone's uh, opinions on that. I think I'm somewhat under time, so yeah. Yep, oh, okay. So the site is, uh, DNS is broken, so check later. <laughs> I don't think we have time for questions because this went a little over time. So I'll take one. Oh, because I ate into that with the screen issue. Uh, so a lot of what you've talked about is, at least in my experience, either problems that are partially solved by or infrastructure that's already provided by reproduciblebuilds.org and other efforts in software reproducibility is trying to reduce duplication or even take advantage of the things that reproduciblebuilds.org provides that you haven't talked about, like visualization, historical data, uh, ecosystem health. Is that kind of in scope or something you've considered? Yeah, so, I mean, my understanding, and I, I'm having spoken and worked a lot with the, the community is that the existing efforts have largely focused on uh, third-party language packagers. So uh, Debian like really blazed the trail uh, for, for these efforts and the you know, tremendous work, I think, of uh, members of that and the general reproducible builds community has really, um, yeah, uh, made this possible. I don't know of specific efforts uh, around language packages in exactly the same fashion. Uh, Rebuilder D, you may know of, that is, uh, again, sort of targeting, uh, uh, I believe, Arch Linux, and uh, I believe they can rebuild Debian packages as well. Uh, but those, again, target those downstream repackagers. And I think a very similar model, but with more emphasis on you know, the less structure and availability we really have. So focusing more on the inference piece and distributing the metadata along common supply chain sort of avenues is, you know, uh, um, certainly related, but not uh, sort of done, really. Um, yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much. <laughs>